Sidney Powell was thought to be a kind, sensible, and loving daughter. But it turns out that this 19-year-old student was actually a killer in disguise. When Brenda Powell returned home after a shocking revelation, she had no idea that the conversation she was going to have with her daughter would end in the most violent and sadistic of ways. And even after this series of terrible events, our assailant would do her very best to trick the authorities. Hi folks, and welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. My name is Adrian, and today we're looking at the potentially clinically insane case of Sidney Powell. Now I say potentially because, well, just watch the video and find out for yourself. But this one will be sure to split the audience. By the way, Coffeehouse Crime is all about true crime, strange, and chilling stories, and the best way to support me is by subscribing to the channel. So, if you want to see more stories like this, please hit subscribe now. I also try to respond to most comments in the first hour of all videos going live, so if you want to catch me, hit the bell notification too. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Sidney Powell. Welcome to Akron, Ohio, folks. Found just south of Cleveland in the Buckeye State, Akron is a relatively small city with no more than 200,000 residents calling it home. Known as the rubber capital of the world, there are only two things that could possibly mean. Unfortunately, it's the boring option today. Akron is well known for its tire production, with the likes of Goodyear, Firestone, Goodrich, and General Tire calling this place home. Surprise, surprise, manufacturing comes full circle here too. The city is also becoming well known for its illegal dumping of tires, and the council has so far identified over 4,000 stray tires this year looking for a good home. There is a dark side to Akron's history too. The city is plagued with chemical toxicity from the constant release of polymers into the land, water, and air. And although it is rather mild, that makes it even worse in a way, because chronic diseases caused by these occupational toxins take 20 to 40 years to manifest. Maybe it was the fumes that made our killer in this video so incredibly thick. But before we get there, let me introduce you to an incredible woman named Brenda Powell. Born on March the 19th, 1969, in Salem, Ohio, Brenda Powell was a natural caretaker. Even from a very young age, she loved to work with kids, and was deeply interested in caring for other people. Now, naturally, as she progressed through her education, she geared her studies towards her passion for caretaking. And so, it is no surprise that after graduating from the University of Akron with a child life degree, she worked at the nearby healthcare facility named Akron's Children's Hospital. While here, Brenda's skill set and calm demeanor were recognized as she worked with children of all ages. Specifically working in the Center for Childhood Cancer and Blood Disorders, her motherly attitude and deep understanding of childcare made her a massive asset to the team. And over the course of the next 28 years, she worked in this hospital. She also went on to develop the ward's oncology teen program and planned activities to help families and children celebrate each step of the recovery from cancer. Brenda was legendary at that hospital, and children and and co-workers alike absolutely loved her. She was like a second mother to many, treating the children that she cared for just like her very own. Focusing on her personal life, Brenda was a happily married woman with two children. Her husband, Steve, described her as deeply devoted to her work, friends, and family. After meeting in the year 1995, it didn't take long for the couple to tie the knot, and only a year later, the two were happily married. Soon after marriage, they found their firstborn daughter to be on the way. The couple excitedly named her Sydney, and soon after, her brother Andrew followed a few years later. The four-person family happily lived together peacefully in Akron, Ohio. Brenda and Steve were financially well off too, meaning the family did not have much to worry about when it came to money. Hats off to them, they provided a stable and happy home for their children, and hopefully, they would end up just as healthy as their home environment. Sydney and Andrew were born into a Catholic home, and as for education, Sydney first attended St. Sebastian Elementary School before graduating from St. Vincent St. Mary High School in 2018. While in high school, Sydney performed exceedingly well, and was well known to be an absolute pleasure to be around by both teachers and students alike. She was friendly, but not outspoken, and was well-liked, but did not go out of her way to grab attention. 
I guess you could say that she was ambiverted or quietly confident. Friends say she came across as shy when you first met her, but over time, when she warmed up to you, her personality would shine through and on the sports field, she was a talented athlete. After graduating high school, Sydney decided to attend Mount Union University, which is around an hour away from Akron. In her mind, this was far enough to give her space, but close enough to get back to family if she needed them. Due to her academic success in high school, Sydney was awarded a scholarship by Mount Union, which she gladly accepted. Although it was bittersweet to say goodbye to her parents, she knew that, in the back of her mind, they were never more than a short drive away from her. Speaking of her parents, Sydney had fostered a great relationship with both of them throughout her younger years. And while she did get along very well with her father, she was incredibly close to her mother, Brenda. I mean, thanks to her mother's background in childcare, the two were were very tight from the beginning. They had a very healthy relationship, and Sydney would often come to her for advice, a chat, or even just to send memes. Now, Sydney's first semester at university started very, very successfully, and she was living with her best friend from high school named Lauren. As their first semester progressed, Sydney found it rather easy to come out of her shell and meet lots of new people. She joined a sorority met more people around campus, and gained newfound confidence. From the outside, it seemed that nothing could stop her from having an incredible four years at Mount Union. But unfortunately, that would soon fall apart. Over the course of the next three semesters, Sydney excelled in her academic work, passing each course with flying colours while making many new friends among her peers. And during the summer, she would move back home to rekindle her close relationship with her family, while simultaneously working all around Akron in part-time jobs. Now, bear with me and my explanation here, because it's very important to our case today. When it came to academics at Mount Union, students could view their progress through an online portal. They could view syllabi contact teachers, and plan study groups here too. Now, the parents also had access to this portal, where they could pay tuition, contact school administrators, and stay up to date with the college and its attendees. However, they wouldn't be able to automatically see their kids' grades. While Sydney's parents could theoretically submit grade requests if they wanted to, they knew that their daughter wasn't having any issues at school. She had done so well in high school that, in their minds, she was maintaining those high marks at college too. Now, Sydney hadn't alerted her parents to any issues either, and so when her father Steve logged onto the portal in January of 2020 to pay her tuition fees, he didn't even bother to check her marks. Strangely enough though, after entering his usual login details, he was then immediately kicked out and unable to sign back in. After informing Sydney about the situation, she promised to contact the staff and get it fixed. However, one month later, in February of 2020, he still couldn't log in to pay tuition. And so, worried that something might be wrong with the system, he then contacted the administration team to see if they could help him out. Making this call to the student relations team on March the 3rd, Steve believed that he could likely get this issue fixed with no problem whatsoever. However, what he ended up learning instead was totally unexpected. The reason he couldn't pay tuition was because Sydney was no longer enrolled at university. And so now, Steve was left wondering what on earth happened with his daughter. Surely this must be one huge mistake. I mean, what could possibly have happened to cause his daughter to leave so abruptly? After all, she had been an academic star for so long throughout her education. As any concerned parent would, he inquired further, but was quickly shut down by the Mount Union administration. They claimed that the nature of that information was private to Sydney only, and if he wanted to find out more, well, he would have to talk to her directly first. Unknown to him, but Sydney had actually been on academic suspension since December of 2019, this happening after failing three out of her four grades for the autumn semester of her sophomore year. Now, while this sounded serious, and I guess it was, it did not technically have to be the end of Sydney's college career. Her suspension was only for one semester, and she could prove her worth again simply by re-enrolling the following semester if she wanted to. 
Now, when a student at Mount Union is academically suspended, they are sent a letter informing them of the suspension process and how to proceed. This letter is extremely important to the student, as it needs to be signed, dated, and then returned to the school in order to re-enroll. And while we know that Sydney did actually receive this letter, we aren't quite sure why she chose not to sign it and return it. I mean, it's not like she didn't want to be there either, because even after her suspension, she continued to live at college as if nothing had happened. To make things even stranger, she even continued to go to class, attend sorority meetings, and hang out with friends during this time frame. However, no surprise, this was clearly against school rules. And so, soon enough, Sydney found herself facing the administrative board. At first, the university seemed to be rather understanding of her situation. It makes sense that a student may have difficulty accepting their new reality. And to provide an additional layer of comfort, the administration team even offered to help Sydney break the news to her parents. Instead, she lied to the board, claiming that her parents already knew of her suspension but were on an extended holiday, and therefore couldn't help her move out of her dormitory. But after their third meeting with Sydney, she no longer had an option, and on February the 24th, she was evicted and forced to move out alone. Still unable to face her parents, she resorted to staying in nearby motels until the 3rd of March. And of course, that is when her father, Steve, found out about her web of lies. Both amazed and bewildered by the news, Steve then hung up the phone before checking Sydney's location. You see, the family shared a tracking app to keep each other safe and know each other's whereabouts, and that is when he learned that Sydney was currently back at the family home. But before returning home, Steve called his wife Brenda to let her know about this very strange and concerning situation. No surprise, neither of them were too pleased. I mean, to put things blunt, their daughter had basically failed out of college and then lied about the situation for several weeks. How would you feel if your kid did that to you? Instead of getting overly upset, Steve asked Brenda to meet him at home after she finished her work. In the meantime, he would try to understand Sydney's side of the story. And so, leaving his own phone at the office so Sydney wouldn't see him coming, he then returned back home in his car, arriving shortly after 11.30. When confronted, Sydney quickly broke down. She told her father that all of her friends seemed to have it all figured out, that they were working towards degrees that mattered, had tangible goals, and were actively pushing towards their dreams. But sadly, Sydney no longer felt that way anymore, and when comparing herself to the people around her, she felt like a failure. Self-esteem can be a challenging thing to work through. It is often said that while we are busy doubting ourselves, others around us are enamored or even intimidated by our full potential. And sometimes, in those moments of self-doubt, you must focus on the perspective of those who love you and not your own. And Steve understood that and knew how bright his daughter really was. He reassured her that if she put a little bit of effort in with him, they could help her get back on the right path together. Feeling better about the situation, Steve told his daughter to sit tight and talk to her mother when she returned home. But as for himself, he needed to go back to the office. Back at work, Steve received a text message from Brenda. She had left work early to get back home, arriving around 12.15 p.m. 26 minutes later, at 12.41 p.m., Steve responded with, What did you discuss with Sydney? Sadly, he would never receive a message back. Only 10 minutes later, Steve received a phone call from one of his friends that being a detective with the local police department. He called Steve to ask if everything was okay, because apparently he had heard that officers had just been dispatched to the Powell residence. Something was wrong. What Steve and the police didn't realize is that at the time Brenda was walking into the family home to speak to her daughter, she was actually on the phone to student relations. And while Mount Union staff were talking to Brenda, they suddenly heard a loud argument and some very concerning sounds. A series of screams echoed down the phone line, followed by several thuds and then a loud crashing sound. And then, all of a sudden, the phone line went dead. Concerned for Brenda's safety, the Mount Union staff immediately called 911. They then tried to call Brenda back numerous times, and after several attempts, they finally made their way through. But the other person on the line wasn't Brenda. It was someone impersonating her. Staff knew that this was Sydney immediately, and after calling her out and telling her that the authorities were on the way, 
Sydney abruptly hung up the phone. Steve, who was still in the dark with the situation, was now beginning to panic. He had just been at the property, so what possibly could have happened in the hour he was away? Frantically calling both his wife and his daughter, it took multiple phone calls before Sydney finally answered. She sounded terrified and claimed that someone had broken into their house. When Kenneth and the other officers arrived on the scene at 1900 block of Scudder Drive, it was a complete disaster. The house was in total disarray, multiple windows were broken, and blood could be found everywhere. Sydney was found frantically crying outside on the driveway. The young woman appeared to be completely distraught, and was clawing at the asphalt enough to make her fingernails pull back and bleed. Officers pulled her away to a quieter place to calm her down, and once she was able to calm down enough, she told them what had allegedly happened. Sydney claimed that while she was having a conversation with her mother about her school grades, an armed stranger suddenly broke into the property. Brenda then told Sydney to run and get help but when she returned, she found her mother lifeless on the ground. Apparently, she had been stabbed multiple times and was bleeding out. Paramedics rushed Brenda to the hospital. They confirmed that she'd been stabbed more than 36 times, and that, furthermore, she had experienced blunt force trauma to the back of her head. Sadly, the extent of her injuries was all too much for her, and soon after arriving at the hospital, she was pronounced dead. Meanwhile, at the crime scene, officers were still trying to piece together what exactly happened. The house was absolutely trashed, and there was an obvious sign of struggle. Furniture was flipped over and smashed, and there were bloodstains in multiple rooms. To investigators, the story that Sydney was feeding them was becoming increasingly far-fetched and suspicious. For one, she had blood all over her hands, and that's when they noticed that she had wounds on her face, torso, and arms. In addition to this, the officers were also quick to note that most of the windows seemed to be broken from the inside rather than the outside, of course therefore suggesting that this was a staged break-in. None of this was making any sense. It didn't take long for them to conclude that Sydney was the most likely person behind the attack, and those doubts were only further perpetuated when Brenda's phone call was revealed to the authorities. The morbid conclusion would be sure to rip the family in half for a second time in the very same day. Both Steve and Andrew were only just getting to grips with the loss of their mother and wife, and now they would face losing Sydney in an entirely different way. So, what really happened inside that house? Did Sydney methodically kill her mother in cold blood, or did she snap in a state of psychosis? On April the 6th, Sydney Powell was officially indicted on charges of murder, felonious assault, and tampering with evidence. On April the 17th, after pleading not guilty, the judge granted her a bond of $25,000 with maximum pretrial supervision alongside a mental health evaluation. Sydney was sent to reside with her grandparents under their very close watch, with daily checkups from the police to make sure that she was behaving. After evaluation by a medical professional, Sydney Sydney's attorney changed her plea to not guilty by reason of insanity. This set back the trial quite significantly, and a second medical examination was requested by the Summit County Prosecution. In order to proceed with the trial, it needed to be very clear whether Sydney had premeditated the attack or was going through a mental break when she killed her mother. Despite the terrible murder, Sydney's family members still supported her before the legal proceedings began. Speaking during pre trial, Steve said, I don't know why we're doing this. This isn't what anyone wants here. I don't know how I can handle it. I'm just trying to keep my family together. And Sydney's maternal grandmother, Betsy Brown, also said, All of this is opening things we hoped to put behind us. According to Steve, the Powell family was in full belief that their daughter was acting out of her mind during the killing. And now that she was on medication and supervised, she was back to her usual self and appeared to no longer be a danger to society. Despite their pleas, her 10-day trial would begin on September the 7th, 2023. Many witnesses were called to testify, including one of Sydney's teachers, 
the staff that spoke to Brenda over the phone on the day that she died, and numerous mental health experts. Day one of her trial included both sides making their case. Sydney's defense team claimed that she was dealing with undiagnosed schizophrenia and was out of control in a psychotic break when she killed her mother, hence justifying her plea of insanity. They would also point out a lack of motive and the sheer brutality being entirely out of character for her. In short, this was simply not something Sydney would do in a sane state of mind. But on the other hand, the prosecution claimed that Sydney was utterly aware of what she was doing. Trying to cover up the crime scene and trying to impersonate her mother over the phone were all strong indicators of a sane person trying to mislead the investigation. Sydney's father took to the stand and painstakingly went through the events of the day that led up to the murder. Friends and co-workers of Brenda also spoke about the shocking murder and how, to their knowledge, the mother and daughter had a very close relationship leading up to the death. Mount Union officials testified that they heard repeated thuds and screaming while they were speaking with Brenda Powell, which, tragically, was likely the very moment that she was being attacked. Frazier testified that the call ended around one and a half minutes after the ruckus. He tried calling back, and then, on his third attempt, Sydney answered the phone pretending to be her mother. Sydney's roommate and best friend Lauren also testified at her trial. She claimed that, leading up to the murder, there seemed to be nothing wrong with Sydney and that furthermore, there was no bad blood between her and her mother. She also testified that she saw Sydney only one day before the murder on March the 2nd at a bachelor's party, and apparently, Sydney seemed to be her usual bubbly self. The following five days of Sydney's trial were devoted to her state of mind on the day of her mother's murder, with several psychologists giving their own opinion as to what may have happened. Dr. Swale testified that Sydney was out of her mind at the time, and further diagnosed her with bipolar type schizoaffective disorder and being acutely psychotic. And Dr. Reardon, who also evaluated her in the year 2021, agreed that she had severe mental illness. And he further testified that the spontaneity, brutality, and lack of motive in the attack all suggested that she was experiencing some sort of psychotic break. On the other end of the spectrum, clinical psychologist Dr. Sylvia Obradovich came to the conclusion that Sydney was malingering or exaggerating her mental illness to escape responsibility. She explained that the best source of information for an insanity evaluation is what was said and felt at the time of the incident and that, in this case, it simply did not add up to schizophrenia. She also noted that Sydney reported that she was experiencing symptoms at the age of 11, which would make her case extremely rare. Interesting fact, but women typically experience symptoms of schizophrenia for the first time from their mid to late 20s, making Sydney Powell's case extraordinarily unusual if it was true. Both sides gave very compelling arguments, but on September the 20th, 2023, and after deliberating for 9 hours and 23 minutes, the verdict was finally in. The jury unanimously found 23-year-old Sydney Powell to be guilty on account of murder, felonious assault, and tampering with evidence. Verdict form number one as to count one reads, we the jury in this case being duly impaneled, sworn, and affirmed, do hereby find the defendant Sydney Powell guilty of the offense of murder as charged in count one. Verdict form number two reads, we the jury in this case being duly impaneled, sworn, and affirmed, do hereby find the defendant Sidney Powell guilty of the offense of murder as charged in count two. Verdict form number three reads, we the jury in this case being duly impaneled, sworn, and affirmed, do hereby find the defendant Sidney Powell guilty of the offense of felonious assault as charged in count three. And finally, Verdict form number four reads, we the jury in this case being duly impaneled, sworn, and affirmed, do hereby find the defendant Sidney Powell guilty of the offense of tampering with evidence as charged in count four. On September the 28th, one week later, Sydney appeared in court for the final time for her sentencing. In the end, for the murder of her mother, she was given an indefinite term of 15 years to life in prison. On count one, ma'am, I sentence you to an indefinite sentence of 15 years to life in the Ohio Department of Corrections. On count four of the indictment, I sentence you to three years in the Ohio Department of Corrections. Those two sentences to be run concurrent with and not consecutive to each other. 
Just a random side note, but many people who followed this trial online were quite outraged at Sydney's family, who provided continuous support to her throughout her trial. Most of Sydney's family believed that she was not in her right mind at the time of murdering her mother, and her father still believes that she should be free from the judicial system. Honestly, it is quite hard to form an opinion here, because on one side, Sydney's family definitely know her best, but on the other, they are quite clearly biased. Regardless of her mental state, murder is still murder, and in my opinion, she should still face the consequences of her actions. Which, quite clearly, she is now, and Sydney will spend many years of her life behind bars, hopefully racked full of guilt. But anyway, I'd love to know what you think about this one, because this case was not quite clear-cut. Do you think Sydney was experiencing psychosis, or do you think this was just a fit of rage? Let me know in the comments below, folks, and I think I'm gonna wrap this one up here today. Thank you so much for watching, I really do appreciate you being here, it means the world to me. Before I go though, if you want to get early access to my videos or just support the channel, then please check out my Patreon. Alternatively, check out my social media, most notably my Instagram. But yeah, I think that's pretty much it today, folks. Thank you again so much for watching, I honestly really do appreciate you being here, it means the world to me. Anyway, I'll see you again very soon for another one. Until that moment arrives though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and as always, stay safe. Thank you. And goodbye.